Siege of the Atlas expansion, much like War for the Atlas, has us exiles fighting off two devastating eldritch forces that wish to stake their claim on the Atlas. But Siege has a twist. We are acting on behalf of the Maven, who is herself a cosmic entity with possibly dangerous intentions for the Atlas. We must become her champion to take on the mortal champion sent by these forces to win the Atlas. Like the Elder to the Decay, these forces have not come themselves. They have sent entities on their behalf. And like the Decay, we must stop these two forces, the Tangle and the Cleansing Fire, from conquering and consuming the Atlas and Rayclast. By defeating their champions, we can hold them back, for now. But what are these forces? Why does the Searing Exarch have a symbol that looks like a combination of sin and innocence? What happens when the Maven gets her way? And why did Xana leave me? Let's start with how us getting to the endgame has been rewritten for this expansion. Like most expansions, our accomplishments from previous endgames has been attributed to another exile. Now, after we defeat Kitava, Lily asks us to join her on a boat adventure, and we do so for an entire year. Boat League finally happened. During this time, Xana, Kirak, and the Elder Slayers, also known as the Conquerors, all team up to take down the Elder. Cirrus gets trapped with the Elder, escapes the Atlas imprisonment Xana created, and wreaks havoc on Oriath. Xana had recruited a mysterious other exile to fend off the Elder Slayers and Cirrus, and in the final showdown with Cirrus, this exile dies, alongside 800 citizen vanguards led by Kirak. Xana walks off into the Atlas, according to Helena, and Kirik suspects this is both because of heartbreak from the events, her friend and potential lover killed before her, but also for vengeance. In this new timeline, we've never even met Xana, although you can still keep her as an unsettling ghost in your hideout. We arrive after a year on the Ka Rui shores, and Kirik has continued the study and exploration of the Atlas in Xana's absence. Helena has been recruited as an archaeologist, something she used to do for the Blackguards and Dominus, now focusing her research on all things relating to the Atlas. Kirak is taking groups of his vanguards to explore in the Atlas, but he has recruited us for a special mission. He has encountered the Envoy, who has informed Kirak that they are coming, as he does, and both Kirak and the Envoy urge us to act as the Maven's champion to fend off whoever they are. As we make our way through the Atlas, we discover the luminous astrolabe and the flesh compass, which guide us to find areas influenced by the cleansing fire and the tangle, respectively. Really, we are seeking the champions of these forces, the Black Star and the Searing Exarch for the cleansing fire, and the infinite hunger and the eater of worlds for the tangle. We must fight these champions because, as the envoy says, were conflict even possible between the eldritch forces, it would rend the very cosmos asunder. Order requires that mortal champions are wagered and set against one another. Order here may be a reference to the Lightkeeper. If you watched my Maven and Envoy video, the Lightkeeper and Progenitor were two entities who were involved with the creation of and care for the Maven. The Envoy, before they arrived, had said to us, Order and ambition urge progress, and time and entropy stay progress's hand. He often talks of the Lightkeeper and Progenitor as necessary opposites the Lightkeeper being order and time, the Progenitor being ambition and entropy. And this is reinforced when the Envoy now tells us, the Weavers of Destiny do not share knowledge of the path. The murmurs of the Lightkeeper are not for our understanding. He illuminates the way forward, but our eyes are ever locked downward on the steps we take. Only the progenitor may cast its gaze forward, birthing new ambitions apace as the old turn to dust in the light. It is simply the way it must be, so that existence may be. So while we have not been graced by the presence of the Lightkeeper or progenitor in this expansion, we learn a bit more about them. 
They seem as forces, possibly even more great and all-encompassing than the tangle, cleansing fire, or decay. They are a duality, order and chaos, light and dark, back and forth. And while they are not themselves here, the envoy hints that we, and the champions we are fighting, are all part of something much grander at play. Let's discuss the forces we are fighting. I'll start with the Tangle because it is less complicated. The Tangle is an ever-consuming, ever-consumed mass of bodies, and each thing it devours becomes part of its being. Sort of like a horrifying Katamari. Nothing it consumes dies, it just becomes part of the hungry mass, as seen on Melding of the Flesh Jewel. Grasping limbs coiled around us, into us. We sank into each other, then rose into the living sky. My family screams alongside me still. The Tangle's champions are the infinite hunger and the eater of worlds. They are both pretty on the nose, hungry boys who want to eat our world. Fun fact, the infinite hunger's disgusting looking arena is called the seething chime, chime being the acidic fluid and partly digested food that goes from the stomach to the intestine. So fun. The Tangle and its champions don't seem to have any ties to Rayclass or current lore, unlike the cleansing fire, but the threat of the Tangle is certainly fearsome. The Envoy did mention a Tangle in his previous ramblings to us when the Maven first arrived, but I do not think it's related to this, THE Tangle. The Cleansing Fire is a mind seeking omniscience, knowledge of everything, and where it goes, everything it learns, burns. One interesting thing about the Tangle and the Cleansing Fire is that the Envoy says that the Tangle is so overcome from its pain and hunger that it cannot fathom the will of its progenitor, nor any other. That wouldn't seem important because progenitor can mean any creator. If the Envoy didn't say about the Cleansing Fire that its obsession with learning leaves it blind to the path set before it by the Light Keeper. Does this mean the Cleansing Fire and the Tangle have something to do with the Light Keeper and Progenitor? I'm not sure. At least, I don't think so directly. I think it means that both are under the eye of, or created by, the two. It seems all beings and forces are connected to the two. The Progenitor creates them, and the Light Keeper sets their path. The champions of the Cleansing Fire are the Black Star and the Searing Exarch. I don't have much to say about the Black Star besides that I think her name is a reference to those worlds and stars that have been known by the Cleansing Fire and are now burnt, disintegrated. However, the Searing Exarch is immediately visually surprising. The symbol above his head is recognizable. It is a combination of Sins and Innocence's symbols, some cosmic amalgamation sent from GGG themselves to make me scratch my head until my hair falls out. So what the heck is up with that? How can a cosmic entity, a mortal champion of an eternal eldritch force, be wielding a combination symbol of two of the most prominent and powerful gods of Rayclast? Well, I've got two theories. I'll start with the easier one. The Cleansing Fire seeks all knowledge. Upon approaching our world, his foremost champion has taken on a combined form of two of our most powerful entities. We know from the Envoy that these beings, force or mortal entity, take on different forms to be viewed by us mere humans. He tells us he takes on a form most pleasing for those who must listen, us, and that when he tries to remember his old shape, the shape of where or who he came from, he cannot. I am anchored by you, Nomad. In becoming a pleasing form for us, he has forgotten his old form. Even if Kirak thinks he takes the form of a man poorly, he is doing so. We have no way of knowing if the Searing Exarch has changed forms to be in the Atlas, or why he would take on Sin and Innocence instead of, say, the Shaper although his outfit does have a striking resemblance to the robe of the Elder, especially with his four arms. The Envoy says, Those who seek to seize the Maven's new realm are chained by that constancy, for they are as foreign to each other as they are to you. 
which seems to imply that the cleansing fire has not been to our world before. If that is the case, the Searing Exarch may just be a representation of the most powerful religion, as discovered once they arrived. It could just be the innocent symbol upside down. It certainly has more in common with the innocent symbol, if you just flipped it on its head. An exarch is defined as a bishop lower in rank than the patriarch, giving it religious connotations in title. Maybe the exarch saw knowledge of innocence, that innocence also used purifying flames, and thought, hey, that's on brand, let's invoke that guy's image. That could explain why he looks like the Elder and Innocence combined. They are representative of his purpose here, serving an Eldritch force and bringing people into the cleansing fire. While that's certainly the cleanest theory and the easiest to digest, it completely disregards the new uniques with flavor texts that heavily imply the Searing Exarch has some direct connection to the Templar religion. So my second theory is that Sin and Innocence are related to the Searing Exarch. I'm not sure I'd say with certainty he's their daddy, but it's possible. A father is never mentioned in the Templar story of Sin and Innocence, only the mother of two. And according to the Omniscient Voidstone, the Searing Exarch spread the word of enlightenment for countless eons without ever understanding its master's message. Could the Exarch have come to Rayclass to spread the word before now? The best evidence for this theory is within the flavor text of New Uniques, but to understand how that flavor text connects to Sin and Innocence, let's refresh on their history. The Templar story of the Brother Gods, seen on stained glass windows in the Chamber of Innocence, is essentially this. Sin and Innocence were born to the mother of two. Innocence was good and obeyed his mother, so he got bread and love. Sin was full of lies and indulgence, so he was given scraps. Sin was hungry and stole a fish from the market in their village. Innocence caught him and Sin beat Innocence until he promised not to tell their mother. But Innocence did snitch, and the mother and Innocence agreed that Sin was beyond rule and redemption and must be purified. They burned Sin alive while the village watched, and the village absorbed Sin's ashes. The people who absorbed Sin, and this will be important later, became one writhing giant, and Innocence committed the town and people to flame to purify them, taking an oath to purify whatever Sin touched. This ties into the flavor text of the crystallized omniscience, which says, that winter, scorched refugees emerged from the shrine, speaking only in strange tongues. They prayed to a new symbol of power, not out of love, but out of fear. Scorched refugees could be the people who survived the burning and cleansing fire, if you will, of innocence's flames. Their new symbol of power might be the symbol of innocence, which is the Templar Descry. If the incident in the crystallized omniscience was from the Searing Exarch himself, I do not think the Templar symbol would be as is. Innocence's symbol is always shown, even in simplified Descry, with the long point going down. The Exarch's points don't even go down at all. There is not even a small one pointing down below the horizontal line. This matches Sin's symbol. The long line goes up. Furthermore, we had learned from Bannon and Valenta that the first Templar ever, Maxarius, was given the sign of purity to start the Templar religion from Innocence himself. Maxarius smote with flame the army of the Faithless with one ray of its hallowing light. But a new unique dropped from the Searing Exarch, Dawnbreaker, reads, The newcomers warn of doom and death beyond the mortal ken. I ask, why should we fear the fire when we serve the Lord of Light? And that is said by Maxarius, the first High Templar. Now, I don't think that puts into question if Maxarius was given the sign by innocence, but it does beg the question, why is this information on a Searing Exarch unique? There can be no other purpose than to make a connection between the Templars and the Searing Exarch, possibly the cleansing fire. There were many referential clues. The Templars have purifying flames. The Searing Exarch serves the cleansing fire. 
the name Exarch has religious connotations. The Exarch symbol looks like an upside down innocence or combo sin innocence symbol. But nothing is as direct of a connection as this inclusion of Maxarius, the first High Templar, on a Searing Exarch Unique's flavor text. That you can't ignore. Matt even says on an official lore post that the Uniques the Pinnacle bosses drop are very connected to their themes. No room for random unrelated Uniques this time. So this item is not a random Unique talking about Maxarius, the first High Templar. It is specifically tying the Searing Exarch to the Templars. Although, we have never heard Innocents be called the Lord of Light. That does sound more like something that the Searing Exarch might call the cleansing fire he serves. And there's another weird bit. The description of Sin as he turns to ash and is ingested by the people of the village sounds an awful lot like what the Tangle is. It says, Innocence watched sin take root in the bodies of men and women and children. He witnessed them turn on each other, first with words, then with fists. Friends and kin embraced in mortal struggles, their skin weaving with skin, flesh bonding with flesh, bone entwining with bone until the village became one writhing giant forged of strife and hatred. Is this just a coincidence that the Templar propaganda slash origin story of Sin describes his effect so similarly to the Tangle? If the cosmic entities are foreign to each other, can any weight be put on this similar description? There are a lot of incidental dualities, as opposition is often stemmed from two ends of a spectrum clashing. Divinity versus corruption, for example. Two ends of the same idea. Sin and innocence themselves represent a duality, but that specific description of Sin and the humans who absorbed his ashes becoming one writhing giant, as if Sin is the tangle and innocence is the cleansing fire, is too striking to go unmentioned, even if I have no conclusion about its relevance or purpose. I considered another theory. Could Sin and innocence be from the cosmos as well? entities that served other forces and came to Earth. There is some evidence of that. Sin and Innocence must be among the oldest gods, as Sin is aware of almost every other god's origin story. He also says to us after we fight Kitava and lose in Act 5 that you shall soar that much I am permitted to see. This made me think that Sin can see parts of the path set before him by the Lightkeeper. Maybe Sin and Innocence are like the Maven, part of the Progenitor and the Lightkeepers group. We do act as Sin's champion in Acts 5 through 10, and Innocence even calls us Sin's hero. And while all gods have some form of divinity, Sin and Innocence's corruption and divinity seem to be more powerful than any other. Except maybe Kitava, which puts that into question. Sin does say to us that, though I am a god, I have not forgotten my humanity. I always took this with a grain of salt, because Sin might say anything to get us to work alongside him, and the Templar story of Sin and Innocence seemed so clearly propaganda. It paints Sin as only bad and Innocence as only good, even when the story ends with Sin being burned into ash and Innocence killing everyone with fire. It didn't describe how they became gods, and normal people when burned alive don't come back as a god. It was only his ashes that were acknowledged, like a metaphor for the sin that lives inside the faithless. Sin even calls himself the Forgotten One, as if his story has not been properly acknowledged and retained in history by the Templars. However, if we take Sin at his word that he was once mortal, how did they become gods? How did they get their symbols? And who is their father? Could a mortal champion of the cleansing fire produce offspring? Do I really want to know that? Personally, of the three theories, that the Exarch is just taking on a form with parts of innocence and possibly sin, that sin and innocence are actually cosmic beings themselves, or that sin and innocence are related to the Searing Exarch, as wild as it sounds, I think the last one is what I feel is most likely. 
The dissolution of the flesh reads, We awoke to a sudden dawn cresting through the mountains. Each peak rose into searing fire, a massive rolling tide. A great eye gazed upon us, and we became known, utterly. This could be a description from another world, as I had believed the melding of the flesh was, which talks about the tangle. But it could also be an indication that our world and Rayclast was visited by the cleansing fire and maybe the tangle once before. And the text on the Dawnbreaker is just too much for me to not see a direct connection between the Templar religion and the Searing Exarch. Regardless of origin, our mission is clear. We must defeat these champions to protect the Atlas from the arrival of the forces they serve. The Cleansing Fire and the Tangle will respect the claim of the Maven over the Atlas and Rayclast if we can defeat their champions. And so we do. But what happens then? The envoy, upon the defeat of the two primary champions, ominously states that this is not the end, this was merely the beginning. We can probably expect more forces to come for the Atlas. But he also compares us to a fish living merely by instinct. The fish does not comprehend its purpose, for it is barely cognizant of the tides that steer its course. Yet it is perpetually in motion, in pursuit of something more. The maven even says to us, the puppets dance on strings unseen. We have been working with the maven, the lesser of two evils in this particular instance, but for how long? Kirak himself is wary of the maven. He acknowledges that the maven has taken many beings to be her toys, including his brother, Baron, and that this is a terrible fate. He wishes revenge against her for that. When all this is through, there will be a reckoning with that creature, mark my words. Clearly, the threat of the Tangle and the Cleansing Fire were more pressing than the Maven. She is still a child, and she is entertained by us, even sympathetic to us. As long as we do not die, we still have free will. She even assists in the fight against these champions, not only giving aid, but translating what the champions say to us. But they never address us directly. They address the Maven. We are, as the envoy has said, an insect charting cracks of the ancient stone on which you stand, blind to the dead stone forest that encircles. We are nothing in the face of these forces. We can only hope that the Maven does not have more nefarious plans for us and for the Atlas. That using us as her toys, continuing to fight for her entertainment is all that she seeks from us and our world. The envoy describes her as silhouetted in starlight. She is forever learning and playing, unaware of the consequences of her actions. I have witnessed inordinate destruction at her behest. She is but a petulant infant, subject to the whims of her desires and unaware of her own strength. What happens when we are no longer entertaining her? As the maven grows and learns, she may develop other interests. Maybe she will get bored and destroy us. Maybe she will require greater and greater conflict, driving the world into dust. Maybe, now that we have solidified her claim to the Atlas, we'll learn she is an entity that serves a greater force that now has an open invitation to the Atlas. Additionally, Sin and Innocence have been down south for a year while we had our boat adventure with Lily. If the Searing Exarch is connected to the Templars, do these two have any idea he was here? Would they know him if they saw him? Would they fight against him? Or would they want to help him in the Cleansing Fire? Would this drive another wedge between Sin and Innocence? And of course, the issue of Xana. She has been upset at us players for some time, and I think accepting the Maven's beacon into the Atlas was her last straw. It's no surprise she left. We are power-hungry idiots, truly. But to leave into the Atlas? That's not a vacation. That's not avoiding the situation. With the Atlas serving as a shining neon welcome sign for eldritch beings, I suspect Xana wants to destroy the Atlas entirely, or at least destroy access to it. And we can't let that happen. Just one more map, we said, 
No more maps, she answered. If I'm right, Xana may become our greatest antagonist, someone to rival piety in her attempts to thwart our progress. This is a fate many saw coming, but actually facing her as our enemy, rather than our friend, will be one of the hardest challenges yet. Thank you so much for watching, it's your boy Noodle. If you like this video, it would mean a lot to me if you check out my Patreon. Just $1 a month gets your name on my videos. It really helps show interest in these because they can be a lot of work and a lot of brain smashing to get done. If you have some theories on what the connection between the Searing Exarch and the Templars really is, please leave them down below. Now that Xana's gone, I guess I'm the only one left to tell you to stay sane, Exiles. <laughs>